Department of English at Missouri State University presents Let's Read the Book of Marjorie Kemp. What is sexual identity? Um, this might be a weird question to ask in a text where we're about to talk about um, a female mystic, a woman who has a series of visions about Jesus Christ um, in which he personally talks to her and gives her direction and she devotes her life to um, religious devotion. I ask this because I, th I think um, if you had asked people in the Middle Ages what sexual identity was, they would have understood the different kinds of sexual identities in different ways than we do now, where you might understand somebody as being like gay or straight or bi or uh, I don't know, whatever other dozens now exist with, with various flags. Um, but normative sexual identity uh, is uh, roughly the same. There's, you know, heterosexual pairing, there's scripts for courtship, there's these ideas of romance and love, um, and there are ideas of what marriage is, what good marriage looks like. Um, these are somewhat different in the Middle Ages. There are connections. We have fantasies about courtly love. We have fantasies about maybe a kind of primitive Viking sort of free, uh, freedom of empowered female sexuality. Um, we, there are also fantasies or popular images of male tyranny, absolute control, which are overstated. Um, and all, but all of these belong to a sexual identity of married or, or, you know, non-celibate. Those would be really the two sexual identities in the Middle Ages is celibate and not celibate. Um, with celibacy holding the higher social value, um, to be a monk or a priest Oh, monks were always celibate, and priests were celibate after the um, late 11th century. Uh, fun fact, it wasn't church law that priests couldn't marry until around 1100. Um, and uh, the, I don't have time to get into all the, reason, all the historical circumstances behind that change. But um, the fact is that celibacy was highly valued, highly revered, and came out of a tradition of um, deep ambivalence, if not disgust for sexuality in the Christian tradition, going back to um, church fathers like Augustine and Jerome, um, who argued uh, following the Apostle Paul that marriage uh, was preferable to fornication uh, since most people were too weak to avoid sex or sexuality. Uh, and so uh, marriage, uh, marriage, <laughs> marriage comes to uh, be a kind of settlement, a kind of a, a negotiated peace with the world that where you can um, sort of create something holy to contain the, dis the, the, um, the ultimately corrupt, corrupting power of sexuality. Uh, this is the, the mind frame that M Marjorie herself has when she d talks about the debt of matrimony. That is to say, having sex with your spouse, as was referred to following, uh, for I forget the, the chapter and verse, um, but you know, pay your debt. Uh, the debt of matrimony was so abominable to her that she had rather eat or drink sewer muck, sewage, than to consent, consent to any fleshly common, uh, that is se having sex, save only for obedience. This is, uh, I don't know if this is in the um, passage, I don't know if this is excerpted in the broad view, but it contextualizes the passage we're going to look at right now in which um, Marjorie negotiates celibacy with her husband. Um, sacramental marriage, marriage as something that is administered by the church, is a 12th century invention. It does not go back to the primitive church. Uh, especially in Northern Europe, marriage was um, customary. It was uh, administered in traditional ways that weren't necessarily um, ruled over by the priest. Uh, more and more, the uh, Catholic Church, the Christian Church, they were the same thing in the West at the time, uh, sort of took over administering marriage, approving marriage, not approving marriage. Um, Hildebert, Hildebert of Laverdan, a um, uh, bishop in the for early 11th, early 12th century, and a wonderful poet too, actually, um, in Latin, uh, 
described mutual consent and love as being necessary for marriage. The, the idea that you could just marry off your daughter uh, to, you know, some prince in Poland without her consent was technically against church law. Now, if you're a 14-year-old girl and every and every grown-up in your life is saying, you got to go marry this, this, this Polish prince, it's pretty hard to say, no, I don't like him, he smells. Um, but, you know... Uh, the, the, it was technically within her rights and her powers. And more and more, especially when we get into the late 14th century and to the 15th century, when we get a rising middle class, a middle class that's increasingly educated and wants to live a Christian life and isn't content to let the professionals take care of religion while the lay people just go about their lives. You know, I do my thing. I bake, I break, I bake my beer. I watch the village, you know, festivals and the priests and the monks will take care of all the God stuff for me. More and more, they want to take responsibility over their own spiritual lives. And they come to see marriage as more of a vocation, a calling, a sanctified spiritual life path. Um, and a kind of religious movement, a way of life arises um, where men and women um, enter into chaste marriages, celestial marriages. Um, that's not the term, I forget. But they, but they enter into chaste marriages uh, or they take vows of chastity within marriage that they're not going to have sex or... Um, in order to, as an act of devotion, as an act of uh, asceticism, as, as an act of cons consecration of the self to a Christian life. Now, of course, both partners have to agree to this. And um, as we learn from the book of Marjorie Kemp, the first autobiograph autobiography in English, the first named book by an author in the English language, remember Marita France wrote in French, um, Marjorie is describing her desire to obtain such a, 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 a situation with her husband and his refusal. She wants him to renounce having sex with her. He refuses. Um, the question of how they come to an agreement is an interesting one. What, what, are, what are the conditions of his agreement? Um, let's look at chapter 11 in the Broadview Anthology of English Literature, or British Literature. Besides the interest this uh, text may hold for our interest in social or religious or gender history, um, the reason we teach it in an English class also has to do with Marjorie's gifts as a storyteller. Her wonderful ability to select details that give life to situations. And I think that is in full evidence here in a way that frames her debate with her husband in a way that I personally find to be moving. It happened one Friday on Midsummer Eve in very hot weather as this creature, she refers to herself always as this creature in this text, whether it's a, it's a token of humility or what. She never says I, she says this creature. Remembering that creature is, well, the literal meaning of creature is created being. So uh, using that term always brings home that uh, she or her relationship with God. It happened one Friday on Midsummer Eve in very hot weather as this creature was coming from the direction of York, carrying a bottle of beer in her hand, and her husband, with a cake tucked in his coat, I love these details, that he asked his wife this question. And she's been harping on him to, uh, to not sleep with him, to, to try to agree to this chaste marriage. And says, Marjorie, if a man came along with a sword and was going to cut off my head unless I had natural intercourse with you as I have done before, tell me the truth of your conscience, for you say that you will not lie. Would you allow my head to be cut off? Or would you allow me to sleep with you again, as I once did? Alas, sir, she said, why do you raise this matter, we having been chased these eight weeks? Because I want to know the truth of your heart. And then she said with great sorrow, Truly I would rather see you be killed than that we should go back to our uncleanness. And he said to her, You are no good wife. <laughs> I find this humorous. Um... Yeah, ear for dialogue, I'd say, and this really uh, sort of brings home their um, 
her her personal struggle to to live the kind of life that she wants but also her relationship with her husband there's a kind of homeliness a kind of familiarity and intimacy of the way that they're walking uh, home here carrying their cake and their and their beer um and just you know having this conversation on this hot hot afternoon and then she asked her husband why he had not slept with her for eight weeks before since she lay beside him every night in his bed and he said he was so afraid when he went to touch her that he dared do no more. Now, good sir, amend yourself and ask God's mercy, for I told you nearly three years ago that you would be killed, and here it is the third year, and still I hope I shall have my wish. Good sir, I beg that you grant me what I will, what I ask, and I will pray that you may be saved through the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. And you will have greater reward in heaven than if you wore a hair shirt or a coat of mail. These were ascetic. There was this idea that if you suffered more in life, then, then you would, that would uh, decrease the amount of penance that you would have to suffer in purgatory after death before going to heaven. Um, so uh, this, this is referring to these spiritual practices of asceticism, which is uh, denial of pleasure or even the... the um, imposition of self-imposition of pain or the mortification of the flesh um what's interesting here to me is also that she presents herself as a kind of intercessor um you know in uh, in the catholic tradition one one prays to saints um not because one believes that saints have the power but because saints are considered to be well connected right there's this kind of like you know, you could pray directly to God, but you're, that's like, you know, calling up, you know, calling customer, you know, the customer service hotline and asking to speak for the, to the president of the company first, right? You gotta, you gotta move up the chain. And if, you, and, and then a saint will pray on your behalf. And one of the reasons praying to Mary is so popular is because she has such great amounts of mercy that she will pray for, 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 for anyone, um, uh, so great is her compassion. So there's this idea that Marjorie here is setting herself up as an intercessor. Like, do this for me and I will pray for you. Sort of configuring herself in this role of, of holiness. You know, she wants to live this holy life. She goes around wearing white and having visions and falling on the floor and going on pilgrimage um, and weeping uh, over the suffering of Christ on the cross constantly. Um and she says, I will do this for you. Here, here, here's the, here's, this is a great deal. I'll pray for you if you'll allow me to make a vow of chastity by the hand of whatever God, bishop God wills. No, he said, that I will not grant you, for now I can sleep with you without deadly sin, and then I could not do so. If I, if I made a vow of chastity, then I'd be, have to abide by it. Then she said again, it is the will of the Holy Spirit to fulfill what I have said. I pray God that you may consent to it. And if it is not the will of the Holy Ghost, I pray God you never consent. And then they went on toward Bridlington in very hot weather, the aforesaid creature in a state of great sorrow and great fear for her chastity. And as they passed by a cross, her husband sat himself down under the cross, calling his wife to him and saying these words to her, Marjorie, grant me my desire, and I shall grant you yours. Let's make a deal, Marjorie. And he's he's gonna he's gonna get she's given her proposal. Agree to this to me, and I'll pray for you. Here's my proposal. <laughs> you know, Marjorie, grant me my desire, and I shall grant you yours. My first desire is that we should continue to lie together in one bed as we have done before. The second, that you shall pay my debts before you go to Jerusalem. Now remember we as I discussed in the context lecture, women conducted their in of their class uh, at this time in England conducted their own business and kept their own accounts so she's obviously in much better financial shape than he is like I'll I'll agree to the, the, your chastity if you pay my debts third and this one I think is kind of sweet honestly that you should eat and drink with me on a Friday as you used to she's she's been given to fasting on Fridays not just during Lent but but all Fridays Nay, sir, she said, to break the Friday I will never grant you while I live. Well, he said, then I shall sleep with you again. Playing hardball, Marjorie's wife. Um, yeah, I, I find this portrait of marital negotiation to be interesting. It is a picture, I think, in some ways of emotional 
intimacy, but also to a remarkable de degree, partnership and companionship. I find it very interesting that he's willing like, to give up sex, right? But what does he want for it? Well, he wants her to pay her debts, which is really interesting, I think. Because for one thing, bargaining money for chastity is, is in a weird way a commodification of sexuality in a way that we wouldn't associate with a holy figure like Marjorie. But, you know, if when, when the Bible is already referring to um, marriage, to, to sex as the marital debt, there's a sense in which sexuality is already understood as a commodity, as an item of exchange. And that that's why it's sort of on the table in their negotiation here. But the, the other things he wants are marital companionship right what keeps uh lay in my bed with me right G give me some cuddles and uh and eat and drink with me on friday don't 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 let make me eat my dinner alone and she's she does not want to break the friday fast thing but then she prays on it um and since she's marjorie kemp this is since this is the book of marjorie kemp jesus comes to her and says you know what have that you don't have don't have to fast on friday anymore have dinner on friday with your husband and and then you'll both and then you'll be able to be chased and i'll be very happy with that and she says thank you jesus and they agree to it um and she goes on uh, not having to have sex anymore um and yeah i will one of the discussion questions this week has to do with the fact that at this point marjorie has had 14 plus children so i'll i'll leave you to uh sort of contemplate how that plays into this um, scenario, but um, I hope you've enjoyed uh, reading this with me and, and looking at this small kind of slice of her life. Thank you.